I make games. Uh, that is all you need to know for now. Um, yeah, uh, and I have a few warnings. Uh, I am a non-linear thinker, I like to say. Some will say a messy thinker. Uh, in any case, I haven't found a presentation system that will allow me to do it my style. So, what I have brought is a series of PDFs and stuff, and you will intermittently see a file system and a desktop up here. So, please don't be alarmed, that's all part of the plan, right? Um, and then, I'm trying to go through my stuff fast. I think I will, I will have to drop something if uh, time seem to be, seems to be running out, but that can be dynamically done. So, I hope you can take a speedy presentation. Um, yeah. Again, I'm Simon, I make games, that is all I will say for now, because I think the subject is more important, right? And uh, when doing a talk like Blender and Unity, staying versatile in games, um, I believe it is good form to actually define your terms first. Uh, and by the way, if any of you are familiar with the game Bullshit Bingo, right, or Buzzword Bingo, now is the time to get out the boards, because as you can uh, read in the title, there are words here that sound kind of buzzwordy. I try to make sure when I use words like that that I actually mean something by them, but uh, you be the judge of that, right? Okay, so Blender and Unity, staying versatile in games. Blender, um, I had to seriously reconfigure this talk uh, after seeing what all the rest of the presenters were talking about and after talking to a lot of you out in the uh, lobby. And I now believe that I cannot tell anyone here much about Blender that they don't know. So that thing I will not be defining, but Unity, uh, as some of you may know, it's a game engine and development environment that uh, is very fast and uh, exports to a lot of formats, um, no platforms. Uh, it is comparable to Blender on an object level, I would say. So you cannot model anything in Unity directly without weird add-ons that people, believe it or not, are making. Um, but you can uh, put together a scene and do a, a, a hierarchy of objects that exist in a space. Uh, so in that sense, it is kind of akin to a level editor. Actually, you have the game view, the scene view, and what in Blender would be called the uh, outliner is the uh, uh, hierarchy window there. And then a library of assets that you drag in and uh, place and do everything with. And then you can uh, work with the settings over here. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, this is from Unity's own marketing buzz, where they claim that they have a 45% market share for game engine in the game engine space, and that 3.3 million people are developers on Unity. I don't know how true that is, but uh, it is very popular. That, that much I know. The main reason why we at our company use Unity is uh, actually this window here. It's a little dark, so you may not be able to see what's going on. It's a. Uh, it's the the build window, and the important thing is down here on the left corner. These are all the platforms that you just click select, and then you can uh, export to that platform. And since we are a company that uh, does mobile and console and web uh, stuff, it is very handy to have an engine that actually exports to all of those. Um, so versatile, I'm just going to drop a dictionary definition here. This is from the Oxford Dictionary. Uh, able to adapt or be adapted to many different functions or activities, right? That's the, uh, if you look up versatile in the Oxford Dition Dictionary, in my opinion, you could put that exact same definition if you looked up Blender software, but um, uh, yeah, that's the point. And then games, and that's where I'm going to spend the, the meat of my talk defining this. And I don't know how to do it except by example, I think. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about how and what we, we do at Knapnock Games and who I am, right? Uh, let's see. I don't know about this resolution now. Okay. So first about me. My name is Simon Nielsen. I am an artist at a very small... Um, Game Studio Knapnock Games in Copenhagen, small but growing, I would say. Um, and as a part of a small team, I get to do a lot of the art stuff in our game production. So it ranges from actually art directing and concepting to uh, doing um, 
more technical stuff up to and including scripting and writing shaders, right? And in between, we have all the actual building of 3D models or uh, layout of menus and UX design and stuff. So it's very, um, very stimulating to have so many roles and, um, and also a weird perspective, I think. Uh, you, traditionally, if you run into people who are from larger game companies, they will have one very specific role, right? And I get to do it all, and I consider myself lucky, but I don't think it's for everyone, right? Um, I am educated from the Danish School of Design, where I spend a lot of time thinking that I was going to do print graphics for a living, right? So I uh, did stuff like this, which are weird indie book covers and more weird indie book covers, and uh, posters and websites and uh, political activism and experimental comics, right? Um, and how I came to Blender was uh, via VJing, which is sort of uh, live improvised video to music. So uh, in 2004, when I started that, all the good VJ programs were on Mac, so I got myself a Mac. And even though the school trained me on 3D Studio Max, uh, I knew both because of the operating system and because of my distaste for software piracy that I couldn't really use that for anything. Uh, so I looked around, found Blender in a much less usable state than it is today, I'd say, but uh, I started hacking around with it and uh, producing literally hundreds of experimental animation clips for use in that BJing situation. I also did this. Uh, I'm going to show a little snippet of this. This is a uh, art installation slash game made with uh, the composer Anders Monrad, who is a contemporary classical uh, composer. And we aim to teach uh, people about uh, con contemporary classical music, which some people would have a hard time understanding, right? So we made this game that is actually a little bit abusive towards people where they can get to compose their own uh, serial music. Yeah. And it plays like this. Here we see character selection. Um, yeah, and here we have uh, Hank Marvin playing against Surfer Dude. And they are generating this uh, serial music in the Schoenberg tradition, right? You get to do that for a while. And then after a while, you have this versus game where you try to deconstruct the composition again with uh, laser guns, right? Yep. So that is what I would do if there were no economic constraint and no money, money to be made. But uh, I have to make a living also. So I do that with, uh, let's see in the following manner. I get to, as I said, concept stuff, um, and then specifically design stuff, which is a bit more rigid. Uh, in a traditional uh, game art pipeline, you, you would have to sort of make uh, these plan drawings uh, very precise and hand it to someone else who would then model. But I often get away with less. And actually, in the art department, I have one colleague, and we speak together so well that sometimes it's enough to just sort of discuss something for 30 seconds, like that we, that thing you made two weeks back, make it like that, but red, right? And he will understand. So we can skip a lot of this. This is where it was actually you know, necessary for something. Um, and then I get to build it up to and including rig characters. These are for some old projects. Um, and as you can see, sometimes the concepts themselves actually enter into the model and get used in weird ways and get projected. And yeah, I think uh, I think now is the time to try and go to Unity. I don't know how it will function. Oh wow! It has detected that we are on a very small screen and therefore put me into game view for some reason. Let's see? Oh wow! Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is the spaceship that, um, that you saw some drawings of here, which features centrally in the current project we're making, and this is how I work with it in Unity. I should say that uh, this is a test scene. It, uh, for various reasons, this branch that I have here of the project doesn't run, so it's not like real. So the, uh, really what would go into the game, but this is where I set up materials and weird effects, which are, this, these planes are currently not hooked up, but they are going to help produce some glowy thing that we need to communicate what, we, what we're doing, right? Uh, let's see. Next slide. Um, yeah, and then I also get to do 2D stuff, whether it's like sort of weird background matte, matte paintings, like that building there, or uh, full UI design, 
which uh, takes more, more time than one should think, but anyone who's worked with any kind of interface knows that, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, and then a, a very important part of what I do is uh, sort of effects modeling. This is a vertex painted thingy, uh, which looks kind of uh, odd and boring, right? But um, yeah, I'm going to skip that. But suffice it to say that this is this will turn into water in the game that is actually reactive to stuff that happens physically and can do wavy stuff. All that is solved via the shader system in Unity. And sometimes you want to communicate, for instance, I think here that um, that the blue channel is the, in the vertex colors, is the thing that tells the shader that this is a top surface, so it should wave up and down, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's quickly have a look at the next one. Uh, these, these are the tools I generally have open on my computer at any one time, more or less. Um, and as you can see, I'm not particularly ideological about open source software, but this is a thing of necessity. I have to uh, be able to get stuff done relatively quickly, so that is why I use proprietary software that I learned in school, right? One interesting thing is the Substance Designer. I would uh, recommend you look that up, actually, if you're into especially tiling textures in uh, 3D work, because that thing save, saves me from having to edit tiling textures in Photoshop, which can be a pain, um, by having a sort of graph editing system where every filter wraps around. If anyone has tried to make a texture with uh, some sort of blur on, for instance, and it's meant to be repeatable, you know that you will get these weird edges from most uh, 2D packages. Right? Um, let's see. I think I'm just going to quit Unity since it doesn't like this solution very well. Um, I've lately been trying to actually just uh, use Blender directly from end to end for uh, uh, producing 3D assets. Um, and I realized this morning that I had to draw a diagram to sort of, uh, to sort of get across what the process is. Right now, this is what I would do, right? I will sculpt something until I'm happy with the shape. Then I will paint it. But in order to paint it, I have to unwrap, right? And uh, once that is done, I we'll have to reduce it to get the polycon count down to something Unity will take, and then export it, right? And my small little point here would be that this would be the ideal situation that I would want. Paint, sculpt in any order, go back from painting to changing the shape slightly, and then have one more or less export step that would reduce according to a uh, number I enter, do all the UVs, bake the thing, and yeah. But that is uh, maybe, you know, uh, in a utopia that would be possible. You know. um, okay, so quickly, Knapnut Games is the company I work for, um, and we make generally we make uh, digitally mediated physical party games. Uh, here's the, here's the team. We are a lot of uh, nationalities. You see here, Danes, Swedes. Macedonians, we have gotten uh, some Brits and Norwegians on the team since this, so it's very international. We're located in Copenhagen. Uh, and here's one project that we made, and that due to a publishing deal that fell through never, uh, never got anywhere. You look like this while you play it. So this is what I mean by physical party game. This is a Kinect game where we map a character directly to an avatar on screen, which is something that at that point at least had not been done, right? Uh, then we made Spin the Bottle, One Piece Party, for which I wasn't the main character designer, but where I worked on other graphic stuff, where you look like this while playing, or like this. Um, so I don't know if you begin to see a trend here. <laughs> then we made this one, which is not a commercial game, but uh, an entrant in the VR Jam from last year, which was uh, sponsored by Oculus, and which we won, I think mainly because of the silly poster here. Um, it is a game in where you get to look like this while playing, and then you can enter any URL and hack a website um, inside, like inside the VR glasses, like everyone imagined hacking to be in the 90s, right? Um, yeah. And just to top it off, we also do other sorts of commercial projects. This is uh, this is a thing called Cloud Ch Chamber Mystery, which uh, is a sort of young adult science fiction movie thing, 
where you uh, navigate a database to try and find clues to the mystery that is the center of the films. And that, that thing is very uh, web-based, and we build all this where you sort of travel along some nodes and try to uncover secrets, right? Um, and that is very typical, I think, because um, like this versatility again, right? That we try to pursue different avenues of, of making money because we really, there are some games we really f feel strongly about and that we want to make, but in order to do that, we have to take on commission projects and, um, and try new areas. And one of the things that is great about Unity is that those projects allow us to build expertise for our own stuff, right? Um, let's see. Um, and, and as you can tell, we are not kind of cutting edge or best in the world at one thing at our company, right? And I don't think you actually have, have to be to make it. I think Blender is also a, an example of having a broad set of competences, right? It's more, you know, more uh, strength in, in, in having, a, again, a broad set and being versatile enough to be used for a lot of things. And we, we try to do the same with the studio, so I see a par parallel there, right? Um, and then we have a very strong uh, uh, opinion about trying to design around our weaknesses, which also means there are things we cannot do and things we know are very expensive. For instance, uh, all the character animation, which is why we uh, sometimes opt to, to not have uh, human-like characters in our game. I will show you what we're currently working on in a minute, um, and that thing is very... Uh, um, that thing is very devoid of character, and then maybe not, right? I want to very quickly uh, tell you about a thing that I also see a parallel with with Blender. We also have a thing in Copenhagen called the Copenhagen Game Collective. I'm going to quickly skip the, um, the mission statement. You can go to the website and get that. Uh, but we make games where you uh, get to look like this while playing, right? So again, here the trend. But that uh, organization is very explicitly set up as a non-profit um, where we do stuff that doesn't pay and can never be business. So we have games where you need two brain scanners and seven move controllers and three Macintoshes to make it work. And that's not really something that you can market later, right? But we believe they're important to do. And then uh, we do game jams and summits and parties and even a play festival where street games are featured um, in, in the spring every year. Uh, and. Again, I see a parallel to the way the Blender Foundation and Institute are uh, set up, right? Um, the, the idea is that some activities will never generate money directly, but the experimentation and the network that we get from it is worth so much, right? And we, we uh, at this point, have a high enough profile that if people want to do something with games in Copenhagen, they almost by default mail us first, right? So, um, so and we are very often able to help them because we have a huge network of not only uh, professional game developers, but amateurs, students, uh, communicators, academics, uh, people who are in and around this scene, right? Uh, let's see, what's the time? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the art direction, I think, and just tell you briefly about what we're doing now. We're doing something with this wonderful man, who is uh, Niklas Nykling, known as Niflas, who makes games by himself. That, or that used to be his, uh, his way of doing things, right? He would get help, but he would uh, do, do the uh, music, the art, the code, the game design, more or less himself, and makes these wonderful platform games with thousands of levels that have all sorts of hidden meanings and yeah. This is his latest game, but he has been doing this for 10 years, right? And uh, we were lucky enough to befriend him and reel him into a finally working on a team, which happened to be uh, not that we uh, got him into. And um, that is, of course, a challenge. Suddenly, after 10 years working on a team when you were uh, used to being a lone wolf, but it's generally going well. And we're making a thing for the Wii U that is called Affordable Space Adventures, where uh, to, set, to set up this uh, trailer, it is, uh, there's a fictional company that is the 
rent a wreck of space travel. So if you want to go to space but have no money, you would uh, rent a spaceship from these guys. And of course, you get for what you pay for, right? Um, this is, this is, I think, six months old trailer from when we announced the thing, so a lot has happened since, but this will show also a little of the main graphics that I work on for, for this game, which is, um, which is mainly about the environment, right? Let's see. So that's where we are. Um, I, I think I should mention, uh, as a by the way, if we look at these, these uh, screen of uh, Niflis's screenshots, what he does very well, he's not uh, extremely good at either graphics or sound, you know, maybe sound, I would say. <laughs> or like he's not, like uh, Knopnog itself, he's not uh, an expert at one thing and then nothing else, right? And what he does very well is make a sort of aesthetic whole, I would say. Like, the, the whole screen has an atmosphere and an emotional impact in all of his games. So, if anything, that's what we're trying to help him preserve in this uh, weird little spaceship project. And that is also why I cannot say that I'm an art director on that one, because he's actually creatively leading that thing, and I'm trying to only uh, support what he's trying to do, right? Hmm? Yeah. And having skipped the aesthetics, come and ask me, ask me later. This is the uh, contact if you need anything. I would, uh, if you want to know anything, there's two uh, URLs there on the top. And on the bottom, that's me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>